sitting now. Hello there, welcome to episode 59 of Right Where You're Sitting Now. We're back. We had a little break. We're back though. Um, uh, we have many shows booked now, which, um, which is quite exciting uh, for the new year. And so, uh, yeah, stick around. Um, joining me this episode once again for is. For the second time. Yeah, the second time is uh, Mr. Mark with a C uh, Foster. Yes, M A R C K. And I have the good fortune to be riding a Shotgun on this podcast, which is going to be beamed at you through the luminous ether of uh, <laughs> the interwebs indeed indeed so yeah so um we've been dealing with some technical issues in terms of um you know uh technology <laughs> that's all i'll say but um, ba- basically we're waiting for the internet to be installed at my studio we will be um recording from there very shortly though which is quite exciting and we may start to do video uh, versions of this show if we can light the room and make ourselves look human or undead or whatever um and the other thing is uh, we're uh, I, I'm, I'm very terrible at um telling people to come and check out our social media stuff so if you come and find us on instagram it's usually sitting now so if you just search for sitting now one word you'll find us on instagram and youtube and all these places uh um we all, we have video content coming um so yeah there's lots of stuff to look out for but anyway, Mark, who are we? Uh, who are we? What are we discussing, and who well, are we discussing it with? Well, uh, me and Ken this this week, we've we've taken a handsome cab through the uh, the murky uh, pea super uh, atmosphere of uh, old London town, and uh, we are on the trail of uh, nobody less than the uh, infamous Spring Hill Jack. And uh, in this, uh, in our quest, we're going to be, a- we are aided um, very admirably by uh, Mr. John Matthews' uh, book, Spring Hill Jack, the, the mystery of Spring Hill Jack, sorry, uh, from Victorian L- legend to steampunk hero, which uh, has been our guide mainly in this uh, in this quest. So there we are. There okay, you go. So, um, yes. It's a very well, comprehensive book. I can, yeah, well, yeah, it's a that. fantastic book. Um, very comprehensive book. And Mr. Matthews, you know, he, 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 if he, what he doesn't know about it isn't worth waving a <laughs> dead fish at or something. Anyway, let's get into that interview and then we'll come back and uh, have a little chat afterwards. Absolutely. Uh, Hi, John Matthews. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, could you give us a brief biography of yourself, please? I'd be glad to. I'll make it as brief as I can. Um, I've been a professional writer for the last 45 years. I uh, published my first book in 1980 about the Grail, and since then I've notched up around 150 titles. Wow, wow that's amazing. I've written about mostly mythology, particularly the Arthurian legends, uh, Celtic folklore, shamanism, fairy lore, and uh, quite recently, of course, the topic that we're on tonight, spring Jack. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I've, I've explored all of those areas, shall we say, over the years, and it's led to some interesting work, worked in film, all kinds of stuff. So Fantastic. So you must have spent quite a lot of time in Tintagel then, I imagine. Uh, not that much because it doesn't really have anything to do with Arthur. Oh, interesting. That's, that's a, a mythic myth. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's uh, one of those things that people, you know, they, uh, particularly the people in Cornwall, of course, love to tell. Mm. But the reality is that the castle there is 11th century anyway, uh, certainly not from far enough back to be Arthurian. Mm. Um, and most of the local legends are very much local legends. Uh, I place Arthur in the north. Oh, okay. particularly around Hadrian's Wall. Interesting. So I can just see their tourist economy crash in as, as you speak. It all witnesses to the vitality of that particular figure, I suppose, doesn't it? It's all, all feeds I mean, into it. It's, it's really anchored there. I mean, you know, there's a new statue there on the headland, but uh, recently, um, and, you know, there's somebody carved the face of Merlin into the cliffs. So, I mean, it's all it's all going on there and, and that's great because obviously it keeps the interest in mm. art live and that keeps me busy. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Excellent. I so, have been working on a new, well, a fairly new theory anyway, that Arthur is actually descended from a Roman, second century Roman legionary called Lucius Artorius Castus. Mm. 
um, who was in this country at the time and stationed at Hadrian's Wall. And there are a lot of stories that overlap those of the later Arthurian legends. So that's that's where I'm coming from with that at the moment. Oh, fantastic. That's bit, uh, we'll have to have you on. We, we've never actually done a show on Arthur, right? And it, we keep getting uh, guests on at the moment where I'm like, how have we never done a show on this before? Spring Hill Jack being a, a big example of that. But Arthur, I mean, we, God, we should have done a show on that a long time ago, really. I mean, yeah, so maybe we'll have to have you back on shortly. <laughs> well, the, the, the book on Lucius Sartorius uh, comes out in March. So, Oh, fantastic. Well, there we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. And also, you know, no, 1980, that's a very impressive uh you know, pedigree or, you know, period for, for for writing stuff, isn't it? I mean, it's 40 years ago, so there's a huge amount of uh, research and knowledge and um, experience, yep. uh, you know. you know. To, uh, uh, I live in a library, basically. You know, we... <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so how did you, before we sort of go into the kind of the story of Spring Hill Jack, how did you kind of come across Spring Hill Jack as a, as a topic for a book? Well, mostly through um, through folklore, because um, I've I've written a lot about, for instance, I've, I've written a book about Robin Hood, and that led me to write another book about the Green Man. And in looking to the Green Man stuff, I found some really interesting parallels with a character called Green Jack, who is an aspect of the Green Man. And this led into looking at Jack as a name, and Jack as a name appears all over the place. Obviously, Jack the Ripper would be the nearest uh, similarity to Spring-Heeled Jack. There's a Clever Jack, Foolish Jack in folklore. They, it crops up all the time. Mm. So I was looking at all of those, and then I came across Mike Dash's re- research, and I thought, this is, this is extraordinary. You know, it needs to be more opened out than that. And I'd never really attempted a book exactly like this before. So it was quite interesting to do that because for once I wasn't writing about King Arthur, <laughs> uh, which would be great. <laughs> yeah, I like the way you've laid out the book where you kind of go through the story via the sort of newspaper articles and reports. I think that's quite a good way of doing it. It's, an, you know, it's kind of almost like you're sort of uh, including reports and then your commentary on the reports. It's an interesting way of laying the book out, I thought. Well, it shows how, how the, the story spread. And it is very interesting. I mean, uh, again, I must, uh, you know, credit Mr. Dash because he um, he did that. He was what what really happened was I started going up to Collingwood in London to look at the newspapers, the, the original files of these newspapers. And I'd already spent about six months doing that. And then I found that he'd already done it and printed them. <laughs> so after my job got a lot easier. Um, but it's it's great because you can you can trace how the story grows to me. And now um We've got this earlier material that he's dug up. Um, the earliest is 1677, which is nearly 200 years before the proper Spring Hill Jack material gets underway. Mm, interesting. So, what kind of um, one of the things that's uh, I think we'll come back to that because that's really interesting. Um, but I think first of all, what we should do is uh, kind of an introduction to uh, to Jack and sort of your kind of overview of 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 what what or who he is, kind of thing. Well, it, it's, it's, he's an extraordinary character because he's almost a composite. I mean, the more you look into it, the more all the separate little sections of it fall apart. But there are certain common factors within it. You know, he, as a, the first major set of, of, of reports um, took, uh, started in 1838. And uh, it was all about uh, individual people who would report being attacked by this mysterious figure. And the description began to be the same for every single one. And on one hand, that may be similar because they were copying each other. But I think it's more than that. I think there really was a person or perhaps people uh, who were feeding off this and using it, copycats and so forth. Um, But the common denominators are always the same. He's tall and thin. He wears a cloak. He has horns sometimes. Uh, he, he wears gloves with sharp claws on them, uh, and he always attacks women. Mm. And the interesting thing about him is that, unlike Jack the Ripper, he never kills anybody. At least there's there's one story that does imply a murder, but mostly they're not rapes. He just attacks them. He sometimes tears their clothes off. He scratches them. Uh, but he's not uh, he's not really a sexual predator in the way that we might think of that today. Mm. Uh, but the same, but the common denominating factors. Um, he's often described as wearing a, a white uh, one-piece suit and a large helmet-like 
thing on his head. Mm. He his eyes blaze blue light, and uh, but he also has red eyes. So this led in time uh, in the sixties anyway for people to start assuming he was an alien, and that's a whole other story. Initially, is always this character who leaps out from nowhere who does whatever it is he's doing, robs you, beats you up, and then vanishes by racing across a landscape with huge strides or leaping over high fences or climbing houses. So he's very mysterious and elusive. But um, that those are the sort of common factors. And you can follow it, really, by looking at the newspaper reports. You follow it. The first one was um, January 9th in Peckham in London. Um, where the, the Times reported sightings of a ghostly figure. And that immediately took off. That one was January 19th. January 14th, he's in Brentford. January 22nd, he's in Dulwich. February the 13th, in Upminster, and so on and so on. And the stories begin to grow, and they get more and more complex. And you hear more about what he's doing, more about the elusive attacks and the elusive material appearances, and then disappearances. By then, everyone's really excited and, and, well, not just excited, they're alarmed. We're afraid to go out on their own, um, you know, especially in the, in the quieter areas of, the Lon of London. Uh, and he nearly always appears in the sort of um, the more or well, the less um, affluent areas, shall we say, in the East End and so on. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Also, like you say, in um, uh, Old Ford and so on, there would be these like Peckham would be more like a, almost like a village yeah. like, a, like a sort of semi-rural satellite on the outskirts of um, the capital and yep. where the lighting and so on would be far more difficult to you know there wouldn't be the lighting and or, or actually the people being around at that time it would be a lot more you'd be more vulnerable especially if you're a woman of course so yeah, well, yeah. at that point you haven't really got electric electric light anywhere you've got gas mm. the so Let's talk about some of the early cases. In fact, you were saying earlier that you think there's some even earlier cases than the ones reported in the book. Maybe we should uh, have a little talk about those. Well, yes. I mean, uh, as I said, the, the most, um, the main sightings of Spring Hill Jack and the main accounts of him run roughly between 1838 and 1904. And it's at that time, a literally, little bit later than 1838, maybe two years after, that the name Spring Hill Jack begins to be thrown around. Until then, he's either a ghost or a demon or a devil or something. Um, and that's very much in keeping with what you get when you go back to the account that Mike's found uh, from 1677, where you hear about there's a, there's a, a letter uh, written by an anonymous person uh, in, somewhere in Suffolk writing to the paper and saying, you know, dear sir, there's terrible events that have been happening here. Um, and they talk about a particular person who's not named significantly, um, who is arrested uh, for some misdemeanor. They don't even say what it is, but he escapes from jail mysteriously, you know, by disappearing more or less. Um, and then we start getting reports of the descriptions of him. Uh, here's a bit. Um, when people have thought uh, that they had been near him, he on a sudden had appeared at far distance, as if they could see, about a mile off. He had been shot at several times, but no bullet can touch or hurt him. He puts men, women and children in great fear and tells the people they seek to take him that he is yet above two years to reign and they are fools to trouble themselves about him. So immediately you've got this strange figure who is more like a, a devil uh, or, or a ghost uh, than an actual... Um, uh, you know, an actual person or, or a being of this other kind. Then this moves on about two years later. You start getting stories about what's called the Hammersmith Ghost. And the Hammersmith Ghost, again, has all the qualities of Spring Hill Jack. He leaps out at you unexpectedly. He ravishes women, but doesn't actually rape them or murder them. Um, and he uh, he disappears by leaping over over fences or walls or running away at great speed. So even before he's been called that, you've already got this image of this strange being. And after that, it just keeps going. And then it, it just all dies down for a while. There are various court cases, um, all of which are detailed in, 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 in Mike uh, Dash's amazing catalogue of stuff. Um, 
and always the same thing, always the same story. But it's not really until 1838 and after that you start getting the more full detail, the full, the full on detail, the description of the, the glowing eyes, the claws, mm. uh, the big cloak. Um, definitely a touch of Batman here. Yeah, well, the, the I mean, as you and your very comprehensive uh, book on uh, Spring Hill, Jack, you you, you make the um, the observation that the, the inventors of Batman have actually also, you know, they 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 have a nod, they have a nod to um, Spring Hill, Jack. There's also another thing when I was reading it, um, you know, with the the claws, the metallic claws, I was thinking almost it's a bit like um, like Freddy Krueger almost because he's a sort of supernatural sort of assailant isn't he but and also and also <laughs> um there's a there's a film um London after midnight 1927 uh, it's a Lon Chaney film lost film completely lost yep. but the uh, the image of uh, Lon Chaney in that is he plays a well there's a number of interesting parallels there that, well the the um he plays a vampire but it's a, in the in the plot. This is a bit of a spoiler here. You can't see the film, anyways. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a, it, the um, the um, the main character in it, anyways. He he's he's posing as a vampire, and he does have this cloak with the um, the bat like um, webbing on it. Um, which and there's one there's one there's one photograph of Lon Chaney wearing this and his pose it, it's totally the same it's totally the um, representation of from the Penny Dreadful the most famous one of Spring Hill Jack the one when I think of Spring Hill Jack that's the image that leaps into my mind my mind pun intended <laughs> the, uh, of him of him leaping over the gravestone you know with his arms raised in that very theatrical way yeah. and um the, and and the, in the photograph of lon cheney man of a thousand faces he uh is is you know is totally evocative of that if, if anyone who looks at that they will they will see you know compare the two images they'll see immediate association and i don't doubt that's no, i don't i be comp i don't doubt even when i say it myself don't doubt that that's intentional that that at least that part of it is intentional I suspect so. I mean, I think the, 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 the copycats and the echoes of this come mm. up everywhere. I mean, in fact, if you if you go online, I can't remember the exact details, but there is a reconstruction um, of what the film probably looked like. Ah. It's all stills, but there's a whole bunch of them. Ah, uh, yeah. I, for some reason, I'm thinking Spielberg did this, but I may be wrong. Yeah. Somebody did a great job on it, and it's like you can't see the film. You're right, but you can see what the film might have been like. Yeah, you get a flavour of it. Uh, yeah, and also uh, sort of in a sort of tangential way to it, to the theme of Spring Hill Jack, the, this particular film, uh, London After Midnight, was the um, it was used in a court case. It was used as uh, some young man took his sweetheart across um, Hyde Park. Hyde Park, and he and he murdered her. And in his defence, when or you know, part of his defence, he he said, "Well, that night they went to see uh, London after midnight." And his motivation was, you know, it was the first time this has ever been sort of uh, claimed. But his uh, his motivation for the murder, or his or the or the fault of the murder, was uh, was laid at the feet of uh, as, you know the uh, the film and uh, Lon Chaney himself. So well, not Lon Chaney himself, but the film. But yeah. uh, I mean, it was thrown out of court. I mean, the defence was thrown out of court. And it was the very first time that was sort of put forward. But the idea of a very Spring Hill Jack himself doesn't actually kill anybody. Um, there's a sort of a flavour to that as well in that narrative. So, you know. Well, yeah. And I mean, in uh, 60 years after those first sightings in 1888, um, we had Jack the Ripper. Mm, yeah. One of the letters that Jack the Ripper sends to Inspector Abilene says, is signed Spring Hill Jack. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. whoever he was, he was also associating or building again on this idea, and everybody knew what that meant. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. It was that that late on because they were still sightings. Mm. Yeah, interesting. I mean, in in eighteen eighty in eighteen eighty seven in eighteen seventy seven, um, he he attacks an army barracks at Aldershot, and um, it, this is a really detailed description from soldiers on the gatehouse. You know, and soldiers are not normally, you know, easily persuaded to believe things that, you know, their eyes tell them unless they can check it out. Yeah. They describe this strange luminous figure leaping over their heads and over the gates and disappearing uh, into the into the, the barracks. 
and <laughs> nothing happens, but it's just this dramatic moment when a a, a spring heel Jack, I would say, rather yeah. than the spring heel Jack, appears and makes his makes himself felt. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I used to live in Aldershot briefly, and um, I remember you know that that story is quite well known in in Aldershot. Did mm. I, I can't remember if it's in the book or not, but he used to touch them with a cold hand, didn't That's he? Right, yeah. Yeah, That's so, right, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he'd sort of surprise them. He'd sort of climb up on the um, the the guard posts, wouldn't he? And uh, sort of touch them with a freezing cold hand, and then they'd apparently there were stories of him being shot at and all sorts. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure that's in the book. I can't remember. <laughs> uh, He's remembering it better than I did, but yes, those that's true. It did it yeah. did uh, happen like that certainly, but yeah, yeah. but he wasn't seen again. It never happened again. It was a one off. And it was quite some time later, wasn't it? It was uh, in a, quite a different area. I mean, there's, I mean, at, at some point, it seems like Spring Hill Jack as a, as a, I'm going to say the title, but I suppose it is a sort of title, became a kind of um, uh, a cover, uh, like a kind of umbrella term for um, it, uh, either this kind of reported yeah um, uh, a behavior <laughs> maybe behavior is the right rather than a thing but uh, a behavior and um i mean in the in one of the accounts it says it, it says um a delinquent of the genus spring hill jack so it's a genus it's a it's a yeah. you know it's a species it's a species of not or maybe not person and not an actual person but it's certainly a kind of um, activity or behaviour, and there was also uh, at the time in the past there was um, a whole f uh, phalanx of um, it's almost much like a sort of a, a sort of national sport of people dressing up as ghosts and and frightening people, usually women, um, yeah. and and um, and they all over the country, even you know from the you know the top of the uh, you know from you know scotland down here in, in sussex or the whole the whole country and um, well that's an interesting thing isn't it because i think most people when they think about spring hill jack they think about him being sort of bound to london but he wasn't was he he um he moved around the country oh yeah he's found it he's found in all sorts of places colchester newport lincoln uh just to name a few i mean and it's always the, the stories are always the same mm. uh the same thing and it's always women he attacks yeah see so never he didn't feel confident enough to attack m men uh, although once mm. or twice he you know the uh, some man right you know does the the noble deed and runs to the rescue and he you know he just deals mm. with them pretty quickly so he could have mm. uh, could have done that but yeah. um and and then of course you know later on someone attempted to uh to identify him with an actual person uh, and this was this is the only figure that's ever come up in history, uh, and he was um, uh, I'm trying to remember his name now. Uh, yes, um, Henry de la Poer, Marquis of Waterford. Yeah, and um, he was considered to be the best contender, yeah. but really the only evidence for this was that he had a particular high pitched hyena like laugh. Mm. And it was always said that Spring Hill Jack, whenever he ran away, would leave them laughing, as it were. He'd be laughing as he ran or lapped or bounded. Um, and that was really the and the fact that that uh, Henry was a, a, a bit of a madman anyway, who did weird things uh, all the time. So he was he was actually never arrested. But I did, did have a file on him, as they say. But. I think that's a false lead myself. Well, there's in, there's interesting themes there as well. I mean, like you say, uh, the the Marquis of Waterford, he were he was a kind of a, a hellraiser, what we would say. He was, uh, you know, getting up to all sorts of mischief. Actually, um, the the phrase uh, "tounting uh, painting the town red," you know, can be attributed to him. As, you know, yep. um, and um, but he did got up to all his antics and his uh, mischief. Uh, uh, it just as himself, he didn't. He didn't seem. He didn't feel the need to uh, don a, a, a garish Mustafian sort of costume. He uh, he sort of just uh, ran amok as himself, and also because of his um, because of his class and because of his uh, his access to, to wealth, he could just pay people off. He could just pay the fine, couldn't he? So he yeah. he hadn't in those respects. He had no he had no reason. And that and also as well, the, the Marcus Waterford, he he seems to pick fights a lot with men. And Spring Hill Jack seems to be, have a different uh, modus operandi in that respect. Very much so, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, the only time that um, he's ever accused of murder is a story about him 
killing a 13 year old prostitute called Mariah Davis uh, in 1845. But that is almost certainly a fake, it's fake news. You know, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, one or two people have, have, have taken it up and said, oh, yes, I'm sure that Peter Haining in particular wrote about him. But I examined the evidence for that and I couldn't find anything that really substantiated it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, Peter Haining is, it can be a bit of an, un, from my humble experience, yes. a bit of a yeah. unreli- um, an unreliable, um, an unreliable source. In, in. <laughs> um, so one other person, I mean, as we're looking at kind of potential identities, so the, another uh, person that was um, singled out was, uh, went under the name of the London Monster. Oh, yes, if you could talk about the London monster. Um, yeah, well, again, this this is um, um, a character who, who required that that name because he was particularly supposedly very cruel. He was accused of multiple murders and multiple attacks. Um, I'm just frantically trying to remember his name now. Um, <laughs> maybe you can, as you read the book just recently. But um, he, he was. Um, yeah, he so, was an interesting character. It's gone. It's it's gone from my head for the moment. But yeah, his 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 method of he's somewhat different. He's a bit more. If anything, I mean, it's too early for be Jack the Ripper, the uh, Whitechapel fiend. But um, yeah. he uh, he's far more. Um, he's far more someone. Well, given the choice, I'd rather meet Spring Hill Jack than than him because he he would use a knife and then and and. and stab uh, the women sometimes in the in the legs or the the behind yes. or um or particularly yep. nasty uh, in the face um i know that i think he was uh, there was one famous case of um him doing that to a woman uh, on st james's street which is just a short um walk from piccadilly circus itself um right. yeah so um yeah, interesting. Well, I was just looking up, trying to find the name of the guy. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm still trying to tr- trying to remember it, but there is there is a picture of him which I have in the book, I think, yes, um, which was a very yes. mild looking guy, hmm. a bit like the sort of description you'd expect him, you know. But then that's often the case, isn't it? It's the it's the quiet ones that you have to be more suspect of, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. But he just looks like the sort of ordinary bloke you'd meet in the street, you know. They're quite well dressed. Rin- Rinwick Williams is this his name? Williams, that's yeah. it. Well done, thank you. Yeah, there we go. We found him. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, in terms of the kind of um, one thing that's always fascinated me because it kind of uh, you, you sort of bump into it quite often are the kind of paranormal or supernatural theories around um, Spring Hill Jack. And I was wondering if you could talk to that a bit. Like, when did when did this kind of paranormal element come into it? Well. It, it, as I said at the beginning, he's kind of a he's kind of a catch-all figure in some ways because um, I I first started to look at this uh, to go back to what I was saying before through folklore and tradition. So I started by looking at the you know the Jack the Giant Killers and the the, the Green Jack Jack in the Box uh, and the and Robin Hood because Robin Hood again is an aspect of the Green Knight and he brings in the lawless aspect if you like into the story um, and. Um, when it comes to the paranormal stuff, it's this strange ability that this guy has. Nobody seems to lay a finger on him. Um, he can just disappear. He can just melt away, uh, literally, as well as, of course, being able to do um, unspeakably uh, athletic, extraordinary things. Again, we're back to Batman here, climbing the faces of, of houses and vanishing over, you know, 10-foot high fences and that kind of thing. So inevitably, people started to see him as a ghostly figure. Um, and in fact, in um, in Sheffield particularly, there's a character called the Park Ghost. Uh, I once did an interview there in, in a in TV studio, and I was talking about this. And then the interviewer pointed through the window and said, see that hill over there with the green on it? That's the place where the Park Ghost used to hang out. Um, so I went and had, had an explore around there later. But um, he just seems to have gathered up all these different materials. I mean... One of the things that I'd not thought about it until I started researching this is is the jack in the box. Now, this seems like a very innocent child's toy. But if you look at it, it's really very sinister because they were always ugly. They nearly always looked demonic. In fact, they used to have, you know, devils in there. And there's even a little rhyme that goes with one um, from 1893, which I found in a toy catalogue. 
and it says, push me down again, dear child. I'm safely hid away, but I'm not gone. It won't be long till Jack comes out to play. Which is a different sort of idea that you get from this nice innocent toy that just, you know, springs up. And again, it had the spring aspect. I mean, you could buy in the in the fifties, you could buy spring heeled shoes in the toy catalogue. So you could run around, you know, even then kids were still playing at being spring Hill Jack. So, yeah, I mean, in, yeah, I mean, in the Penny Dreadful, which is you, you reproduce in the book, uh, I can't remember what year that's from now, but uh, it's, 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 although it's a work of pure fiction, um, yeah. the, the sort of hero in it, um, and he is, I mean, that's an interesting thing. It's an ambi Spring Hill Jack is an ambiguous figure. He's like a kind of folk hero as well, isn't he? He's, there's that ambiguity around him, which is what makes, uh, you know, figures like him so potent. So, you know, so, you know, the secret of their power in the way is their ambiguity. And um, in The Penny Dreadful, which is reproduced in, in your book, um, the, the main character in it, uh, and it struck me how much like a Marvel figure, like something out of Marvel comics, so, you know, he he dons this uh, Mistophelian sort of um, garb and then and writes wrongs and um, and also he has these special boots made with uh, the springs on, which is this you know the secret of his power that he can leap in a single bound, you know, to the to through through windows and um, you know, over stage coaches and all sorts. I mean, at one point he um, he um, <laughs> he holds up a, a stagecoach um, at, at Hawley. Um, which I found, I found <laughs> that's a very exciting thing. If that, unfortunately, it's not real. Is that's not a, a real account? If it was, um, it'd be the most exciting things that ever happened there, probably. But um, but uh, it's a, you know, although it's like a pure you know um, work of fiction, um, they, I, was, I was struck by how you know the narrative is that it's it was seen very much from his you know perspective, and um, he's, he's took on these sort of uh, you know. He's represented as not as a villain. He's not a villain. He's not a monster. He's uh, he's very much on the side of the angels in that sense, despite all those ambiguities in, involved in his character and um, and the uh, the uh, <laughs> the shoes with the springs on, as you mentioned, they they actually produced something like that in the I think the fifties and sixties. I mean, I mean that's more something out of the Beano rather than Marvel, but um, it's a it's a wonderful notion. Well, I mean, he's he's a sort of anti-hero almost. He's trying yes. to clear his name. I seem to remember he, uh, he one of the other some other member of the family has done him out of his inheritance. Yes, so absolutely, yeah. Do it, and I and they made a very successful stage play uh -huh. uh, featuring Todd Slaughter, the actor who later went on oh, yes. to many black and white um, horror movies. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he died in the fifties, with no fifty. Yeah, it? he went on for a long time. But yeah, yeah. Very interesting stuff. I mean, there was definitely a move to try. I mean, this, is, of course, is quite a lot later than than the sort of very sensational events surrounding um, Jack's uh, activities. But th there was a definite move to try and kind of smooth out some of the rougher edges and make him a bit more of a hero. Mm. I mean, I can, I'm sure Bob Kane knew the story when he wrote Batman because there's so many yeah. parallels there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's on record as saying that he was was aware of it and, and I, I wouldn't be surprised yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. one thing i was um, kind of interested in and you do touch on this in the book is is you know the, the actual kind of attacks um the earlier uh, recorded attacks yeah is, is there a kind of pattern to them do you know what i mean is is there um something that kind of links them together other than you know is something that could um isolate them away from being something made up, if that makes sense, is there a kind of uh, a tangible pattern to them? Well, very distinctly, yes. I mean, they they almost always happen at night in in very deserted or quiet places. You know, back alleys, lanes, and quiet lanes, country, um, or out or just out out in the open. Um, and it's uh, in nine cases out of ten, it's women who are attacked. Uh, the form that it happens is almost always the same. Person is walking down the street, minding their own business. Suddenly. Over he comes, over a wall or a fence or a hedge, uh, attacks them, scratches them with his claws, uh, sometimes rips most of their clothes off, goes back over the wall or over the fence or over the hedge and disappears with this cackling laugh. And he nearly always has these glaring eyes. What always struck me as interesting about the glaring eye thing is that at the time, their equipment didn't really exist to make that happen. 
so easily done. I mean, someone tried to suggest at one point that um, it had been faked using a, a, a thing that um, was currently used on stage at the time called Pepper's Ghost. If you've heard about this, a guy called John Henry Pepper, um, who was a sort of very early SFX man, you could say. And he managed to make ghosts appear on stage by setting up a mirror at a 45 degree angle to the audience and then lighting it in such a way that it looked as though the character was on stage. Somebody suggested that the same thing was done to to engineer the, the Spring Hill Jack thing. But again, how would you do that? Mirrors, lamps, all that? You're going to cast It's a very that intricate man? joke, isn't it? I mean, it's very well planned, if, if that's the case. <laughs> So we had several helpers who were busy carrying all that stuff away, you know. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that is another thing that interested me was the how his appearance seems to change. In one story, he has a kind of a lamp or a light uh, in his chest. You yeah. Know, it's, uh, could you talk to that a little bit to kind of how you know how that kind of evolved because it did seem to evolve from. Uh, it, it worried me somewhat because again to do that. Um, I mean, you didn't have, you know, the, you couldn't sort of bury a torch in there at that time because they didn't really exist in the sense bright enough to be she seen or to be shining out. It would have had to be a lamp or a lantern. Uh, even if you're wearing a special suit, the idea of having a naked flame attached to your chest doesn't seem like a good idea. But he, his, 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 the, the, although all those char characteristics are very common, there's also a lot of shifting around, as you say, with horns. I mean, if you start looking at the Penny Dreadful stuff, because <clears throat> apart from the one that I included in the book, there are dozens of others, and there are a lot of them with pictures, and they're all very, uh, very shocking pictures, you know, of people, of him leaping out at, at people or, 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 off, or uh, running along rooftops and things like that. Sometimes he has horns. Sometimes he has a beard. Sometimes he doesn't even remotely look human. I mean, you're looking at him and you're seeing this hairy being. And it looks like you think, oh, that's a demon. That's, you know, the Victorian idea of a devil from hell. And a lot of people believe that he was that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, in the, um, in the outrage, you know, on, on Miss Alsop, you know, the, which is the one that I was familiar with, um, before I read the book, um, that's the you know that seems to be you know the the blue flame. I mean, and the white oil skin, and as you say, the the kind of device attached to him. I mean that. I mean it's almost like he's you know he's sort of Spring Hill Jack has invented steam bunk in 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 one foul swoop, isn't he? He's like, is it's sort of he's 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 invented. It's just all coming in one parcel. It's just a, it's just it's just a, it's just there. It's it's leapt fully formed as it were from the uh, from the thigh of Zeus in the shape of Spring Hill Jack, and um, it's just it's such an um, a oh, also as well the, the 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 glowing red eyes and so on. I did wonder. I did. I did. What I did sort of wonder without if there was some kind of um, the shock of being attacked may have sort of. Um, warped or you know sort of like in post-traumatic stress disorder they wouldn't, they wouldn't have access to a con uh, uh, they may have access to the concept but not the the, the phrase that they, it may have sort of um g uh, g g the recollection of it the recollection of the attack may have been influenced by you know in the, that description if that I makes sense think that's really possible i mean i mean one of the most famous that probably the most talked about attack was one of the very early ones where he attacked um uh, he, he attacked a, a young woman um, uh, called Mary Allsop. Yeah. Um, and she gave a very, very clear description. Yeah. She was obviously deeply disturbed by all this. Yeah. In this one, he actually knocks at the door. Yeah. And this is the part of the story because, <clears throat> excuse me, he knocks at the door and she opens the door and he says, Quick, bring a lantern. We've caught Spring Hill Jack. Now, that suggests immediately that. There was a character mm -hmm. already, yeah, that was yeah. owned by yeah, that yeah. name, yeah, yeah. And you, that's yeah. only about a year after the first one, so Absolutely. whether she knew or not, anyway, she obviously got the lantern and went out in the street, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the, the policeman turns out not to be a policeman at all, mm -hmm. he's wearing a cape, and she's thinking, Oh, it's a policeman with a cape, but then it suddenly realizes it's a bat cape, yeah. and that uh, he's got these, these glowing eyes, and then he attacks her. 
but yeah. she gave such a very clear description yeah. of the whole thing yeah. and of course inevitably because you know when are we living in the victorian era they said oh hysterical woman didn't mm. happen at all did it but then of course she shows them the scratches yeah. and that so they have to take it more seriously and they start looking uh, but it, it's interesting that that specific description is echoed again and again mm. in the succeeding yeah, months yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, as though someone indeed is seeing that and yeah in the shock of the moment yeah. perhaps they're seeing you know what they've been told to see in a way yeah yeah oh, but also actually thinking about it to argue against my own point there that maybe she was sort of uh, imagining some kind of monster uh in the in the you know the shock the recollection of um the uh, the attack um there her sister does come when she hears the commotion and there's some i think it's her sister who comes and hears the um the commotion and then she, she witnesses it as well i think she actually says that she was so shocked that she just she didn't do anything no, that was, she was there were two sisters it was the younger sister because oh, i just literally read this reread this earlier the younger sister first appears and is sort of frozen by shock and then the older sister appears and actually sees him off, doesn't uh, she? Yeah, and, and she closes the door um, uh, on yeah, him. Yeah, 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 that's right. So there are, so there are in mm. that particular missile sop, the outrage on missile sop, um, which is from, uh, let's see, uh, that's, um, that, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. 1838. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, talking about dates, um, <clears throat> Jack does reappear in the early 20th century, and I think that, that this is interesting. Uh, could we talk about kind of ha how he kind of reappears? Um, I'm thinking of like the Jumping Man of Saxony, um, how he reappears, and how that version of of Spring Hill Jack differs from the original um, reported version. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in particular of um, uh, the ones seen in Prague in 1940 to 45. Mm interesting dates of course yes <laughs> the spring man and he actually is a kind of resistance fighter mm. so spring hill jack as a hero again yeah still has the same characteristics he has the bat like wings um and the shining eyes and he, only instead of attacking women he attacks nazis so he becomes mm. a hero uh and i think it's very clear that that was a person who was was um uh you know was was echoing um, you know, the stories which he must have heard, we presume, um, about Spring Hill Jack. Mm. Um, the other one, the Saxons ones, um, are they're very much kind of what I'd call pale copies, if you like. They're much less frightening, much more, much less scary um, than the ones that, that we already that we've been hearing about uh, from the earlier period. And again, it seems as though I think they're copycats. I really do. I think a lot of these later ones are people who'd heard the stories, knew the thing, and you know, uh, you know, just copy it. Mm. Uh, I mean, even the even the um, the story of the uh, the attack on Aldershot, you know, uh, it was eventually almost certainly proved to be a man called Alfrey, mm. uh, Colonel Alfrey, who was a very strange character altogether, and he was a soldier. Uh, and it seemed like an enormously complicated practical joke that he was playing. Mm. Still doesn't explain how he was able to leap so high or mm. touch people with a cold finger and so on. But yeah. but in you know once once the word spread, uh, then of course it goes to America, uh, and you start getting it um, uh, in 1945 from October to December in Provincetown, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Um, there's a character called the Phantom um, who is seen leaping over buildings, climbing the sides of buildings, and in one case, disappearing up a column of light into the sky. Mm -hmm. Guess where that led? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, immediately people started talking about um, you know, UFOs and other things of that kind. And um, I think it was... Uh, Valentine Dial. Oh, Valentine Dial. Another yeah. character. Hang on a second. <laughs> John Viner in 1961. That's it, yeah. A very yeah. interesting article. I think it's in Fortean Times again mm. um, about Spring Hill Jack, in which he said he must have been an alien because he came from a different atmosphere, which enabled him to leap high. An interesting conclusion, really. Mm. Uh, so cra not so crazy if you think about it, but uh, at least if you believe in, you know, aliens and so forth. But, um, but yeah, no, Valentine Dial was a, a great character for those who don't know about him. He was a, a radio uh, actor and announcer uh, from the 
late 40s, 50s. Yeah. Uh, the British Vincent Donald Price. Russia. Sorry? The British Vincent Price, that he British was known. Price. Yes, indeed. And uh, he got very interested in this whole thing and started featuring it uh, in his radio show. Uh, and, of course, that, that reawoke interest again and got people, uh, people talking about mm. it. Uh, but it hasn't stopped there. It's gone on because, um, well, as recently as 2019, uh, a very good friend of mine, this is not in the book because it happened after I'd finished the book, but a friend of mine was driving home towards Tame in Oxfordshire and they were going down this fairly quiet road and suddenly uh, the guy who was driving uh, slammed on the brakes and they both looked out of the car and they said what they saw was uh, a human-like figure who jumped across the road in front of them. And as in not just, you know, kind of ran across the road, but jumped over the road from one side to the other. Mm. A bit luminous, or it was a bit luminous as well. Mm. So, you know, immediately, as soon as they told me that, I said, oh, it sounds like Spring Hill Jack. Mm. But there are other instances. In 1986, I think, is one of the most recent ones. Uh, that was in South Herefordshire, uh, and it's a story by a traveling salesman, so maybe we need to take it with a pinch of salt. But he said he was driving along the road, and suddenly he realized there was a man running beside the car who was keeping pace with him. So he accelerated, and the figure accelerated, and then leapt over a hedge with a bound and ran off into the into the distance. Mm -hmm. So, again, sounds a bit Spring Hill Jack-like, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, it's interesting. One of the things that did strike me is that um, the, the newspaper reports, their take on it, and like I say, it was like a sort of national sort of sport almost um, for people to, you know, um, masquerade as ghosts and, and frighten people at night. Um, is, is that none of them, none of them, although they refer to him as a, a ghost or a demon or fiend or whatever, he, they, they, they all at the same time, they all poo poo the you know the idea that that might be the case it's that they're, they're definitely of the opinion uh that it's it, he he is you know um someone masquerading as that it, which it it is it i was right i was intrigued how miss Allsop, for example um because it's obscured by the the reporter her, what her you know what was her thoughts and feelings on it did she believe that she did was she molested by some strange creature or was it just somebody dressed you know as as a as a monster and uh, it, it, that that doesn't come across in the reports actually to me what the actual victims themselves we know what the reporters for and and that in itself um, you know um, expresses something on the zeitgeist of the times but um, what the actual people themselves who were left afterwards you know how they made sense of it and um, that was uh, that was not so clear to me well, there's no doubt that, it, in, you know, as in any such uh, incidents, you know, there's a certain amount of dining out going on. I mean, mm. not, I think, with Allsop and her family, because mm. they really were genuinely frightened by what ex yeah. by their experiences, understandably. Um, but there's also plenty of, there was there were plenty of people who would describe, you know, being attacked after leaving the pub. Mm. And you have wonder, hmm, well, did you really see anything? Or mm, yeah. <laughs> were you in like, three sheets to the wind and didn't notice? But, yeah. um, but you know, yes, there's there's not much, unfortunately. You get the descriptions, but there's never any room for interpretation of, on behalf of the person who's been attacked. Mm. It's just like, you know, um, this terrible thing happened and dear, dear, tut, tut. And everybody gets very worked up about it. Um mm -hmm. One, yeah, when you were uh, describing your friend's experience of seeing this human-like thing leaping across the road, it it reminded me a lot, actually, of some of the earlier stories of the Mothman, and you do cover that in your book. Um, yes. So uh, talk a little bit about kind of how you kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of compared the two, because there is a, you know, a fair amount of similarity there, isn't there? Well, there is, again, it's the, I mean, the Mothman is, a, is, is an American uh, figure that, again, appears from nowhere, has wings, uh, attacks people randomly. Um, sometimes a particularly interesting thing I find, detail I found, is that he often comes up really close and whispers in their ear, um, which must be quite scary if you didn't see him coming, you know, yeah. or if you did. Um, so there's definitely that echo still going on. I mean, these characters all share the same characteristics. When you, when you boil it all down, um, you know, it's a mysterious figure, strad, clad in strange clothing, um, looking odd, either human but 
very odd or not human, um, demonic, ghostly, whatever, um, who comes up and attacks or frightens people, more often frightens them, I think, than anything else, and then disappears again mysteriously. And then, of course, you have the Slender Man in even more recent times, um, who's this rather strange character who was, in fact, invented by a games manufacturer and some kids unfortunately got hold of the story mm -hmm. uh, were so powerfully influenced that they murdered one of their friends mm -hmm. yeah. and told them to do it you know mm -hmm. um so there's a lot of very strange stuff going on there yeah i mean you you yourself described the spring hill jack as uh, you know as a, a potent archetype and um yeah. and an archetype can always like you know it sort of remains essentially the same the the, the, it's very protean. It can uh, it takes on lots of different um, sort of outer forms and, and shapes and so on. Reinvent itself, like in the Valentine Dahl example of, you know, that's a that's a UFO sort of science fiction sort of. But so is the Mothman as well. The Mothman and the UFO stuff yeah, kind yeah, of crosses yeah. over, doesn't it? Well, and also, I mean, the, 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 yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, actually, also as well, there's um, there's a there's a Kentish Mothman which predates the american mothman but that's a that's another whole thing that... <laughs> yeah we've got uh, too many too many myths we can go into today so um i was wondering what are your own you know after writing this book and um spending some time with jack as it were what are your own personal theories on who spring hill jack is or what spring hill jack is well i mean the archetypal thing is the one that appeals to me most because that's something I've always worked with on, you know, everything from King Arthur downwards. And mm. um, they all have an archetypal quality about them mm. because they transcend ordinary reality, mm. uh, because they draw upon levels of understanding and meaning um, and otherness, um, you know, that you're all familiar with, um, you know, that. I, I, they, they, it's not a normal it's not a human being i feel i mean i'm sure there was probably more than one real person who may have taken on this persona mm. and taking on a persona uh, is a bit like you know if you're an actor you know how it be you become the character if you're a good actor anyway and mm. um i think these were people who maybe started out as a joke thinking i'm going to dress up as spring Hill jack and frighten someone and then it became a bit more serious Mm -hmm. uh, and, and kind of took them over in a way. Uh, so I think we've got not one, but a series of mm -hmm. people. Um, the only one I don't accept, in fact, is the Marcus of Waterford, because it just doesn't make any any real mm -hmm. sense for me to that character. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but the ones that you don't have names for, the the nameless people who, who, who heard the story, were somehow attracted to the story, maybe were even victims, who then took on some of the qualities of this figure, and created it. It's a good, a good, similar thing in a way. Although the character is very different, is Robin Hood, because if there was ever an actual person called Robin Hood, there are at least four or five of them in history. Um, the archetypal Robin Hood, the Robin Hood of Sherwood Forest, the Merry Men, the robbing the rich to give to the poor, and so on. These are archetypal characteristics, mm -hmm. and Robin has always, to me, represented the green greenness of nature the green man mm. and as i said the green man leads into uh spring Hill jack through uh through the green jack character who is which is an, an archetypal representation of nature out of control mm. i think that spring Hill jack is humanity out of control maybe yeah, interesting mm. i guess the only contest to that would be um the the ability to leap buildings and and whatnot but i mean that again <laughs> could, could be <laughs> yeah Maybe invented rocket boots before anyone knew yeah, to. true true so um are you i mean you've you've mentioned that you've got hold of some new um new new evidence or new material um can, are you done with jack now or can we expect some some further well, work or depends to a large extent on the publisher um, you know, it's very difficult to get a second edition out of out of a publisher these days, with uh, especially with the um, mm. uh, publishing industry being in the rather a mess as it is at the moment. But uh, if I can, then I will do a revised version, and I'll put all this new information, um, some of which I found, some of which Mike Dash has found, and Mike's already given me permission to use it. So again, we'll have a lot more reports of these earlier 
these earlier characters, you know, the Hammersmith ghost, um, the monster, as you mentioned, uh, this mysterious unnamed character from 200 years earlier. Mm. That suggests me a link much further back beyond this. So you really are getting back into the the time of the folklore jacks. Mm. Uh, Jack is an interesting name. It just keeps on cropping up. You've got, obviously, Jack the Ripper, our Jack. You've got all these different characters who are um, who, who, who have some kind of similar characteristics from time to time, even right back to Jack the Giant Slayer, mm. you know, just bright and cunning and still manages to kill the giant in various different ways. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing story. Mm. I'm wondering where it's going to come up next because it will, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. And as you say, and as you point out in your book, Mr. Matthews, there, there hasn't been a film yet of, of Jack the, of, uh, they say Jack the Ripper then, the uh, uh, Spring Hill Jack. Um, there's not been a film or TV series or... Not yet, but there might be soon. Yeah, especially with yeah. Netflix and whatnot. They're, they seem to um, be making some interest in TV. It'd be quite... So... I am... I am... Hmm, I am working on something, shall we say. Oh, you know? okay, interesting, oh. interesting. Oh. <laughs> tell you, but, um, but, yeah, there could be. There could be a series. So, you know, I mean, it cries out for it, doesn't it? Oh, I yeah. Mean, I mean, plays, a... There's wonderful series of radio plays that I uh, featured in the back of the book because they yeah. were so damn good. Mm. Yeah. They really caught the... Uh, Jack yeah. Valentine really caught the whole feel of it. Yeah. It's such a romantic period as well. It's the kind of gaslight lit London, okay, isn't it? It's yeah. the uh, you know the kind of Sherlock Holmes almost era, isn't it? Of um, no, it's totally yeah. yeah it's, it's, like, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, I mean, oh, oh, Sherlock Holmes time. versus Spring Hill Jack. There's a there's oh, a film. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. That'd be fantastic. Um, so you were talking about earlier that you've you you have a new book coming out in March, I believe you said um, about yeah, an well, Arthurian I'm, book. Oh, Actually, because it's been because of lockdown and working from home and all that, a lot of things have been delayed. So I kept working throughout. So in fact, I have two, actually three books coming out next year in the early part of the year. One is uh, is this one called Artorius, uh, which is about this very early second century King Arthur. Um, I have another one on the the Nantios Cup, which is one of the many Holy Grails that we have uh, knowledge of. A very interesting relic, and I've put together with uh, two friends uh, uh, a book that explains how the the story came about and how the relic developed, and so on. So that one's coming, mm-hmm. and then I've got a huge book um, called The Great Book of King Arthur and His Knights, which is kind of a new Mallory. It's a new Mort Arthur with all the stories that he left mm-hmm. out um, retold and beautifully illustrated by John Howe, who's one of the artists who worked on Lord of the Rings. Oh wow! Um, and with an introduction by Neil Gaiman. So it's um, mm-hmm. that. Those are all coming out in the next in the next uh, year. So we'll definitely have to uh, uh, touch base with you again. I think in the uh, next couple of months, and because we've I've always wanted to do an after show, so we really should. And it's it's such a vast subject. Um, I may need you to kind of guide me a little bit because it's it seems to span. You know, obviously you've you know enough for you to write countless books on the subject so you know yeah. it's it, it's one of these um you know it's one of these legends where i, I kind of need to kind of find a starting point really i, I think second like century of course but i mean mm. i have spent a lot of my life uh, studying and writing about it mm. um and uh you know it's it's led me throughout my life actually it's led me into all kinds of interesting places to working on films to advising on tv shows to uh, meeting people who believed that arthur was one thing and people who believed that arthur was another thing so yeah lots to talk about there certainly yeah fantastic well thank you so much for giving us some of your time i really appreciate it and i know you've got to go off to dinner now uh, same as us <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll we'll leave you uh, for now but i mean yes like i said we'll definitely have you back on if you'll if you'll be willing to do so yeah i'd like to certainly and can i just say that if anybody wants a copy of the mystery of spring Jack from Victorian legend to steampunk hero. Uh, you can get them from us or, of course, from any good bookseller and supplier. Uh, it's £18, I think, is what we're charging for it. Mm-hmm. Um, go to halloquest.org.uk, which is our website, and uh, you will find that you can get a hold of a copy, which I'll be happy to sign for you. And, so, and an excellent book it is. So, um, and we'll link to it in the uh, in the on the website and on the show notes for the podcast. So yeah, no excuse not to be able to get it.
absolutely yes i expect to sell out next week <laughs> yeah fantastic brilliant thank you very much And we are back. Uh, so what did you think of Mr. Matthews? Mr. Oh, Fisker? excellent. Mm. Uh, he, he, yes, um, he had a very clear idea of what he wanted to say, and um, he was very comprehensive in, in saying it. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, and there's so much. I mean, it, it, it's actually sort of complimentary to, to him that, you know, there's lots of other things I, I would like to have uh, squeezed in there, sort of, sort of snuck in. But uh, that's the uh, yeah. But uh, but uh, an excellent, an excellent, uh, an excellent um, you know interview. Yeah, he was. Uh, you know, it's always good to have a guest that is quite open to discuss lots of different aspects of a topic. And uh, oh, yeah. you know, every now and then you, we, we do come across guests that are very rigid with their, uh, you know, their opinion or um, you know not as giving with with conversation as he was which i found very well important. i mean uh, I, I mean as we sort of mentioned you know he, he, his first publication was from 1980 i mean that's that's four decades ago so you know we've got there's a huge amount of um, experience and um, learning there so uh, a very rich resource and um, i think that's well represented in, in his interview yeah definitely i'm looking forward to talking to him about Arthurian legend at some point as well I think that could be an interesting mm, yeah. an interesting show um but anyway like I was saying earlier um we are trying to kind of reach out a bit more on social media so if you're interested in sort of talking to us uh, find us it's sitting now on Instagram YouTube I think we're on Facebook I don't really use Facebook so if you want to reach out to me specifically um uh instagram or youtube are the, the two ways of of getting our attention or come to the site come to citynow.co.uk and we have a comment section um no one seems to use comment sections anymore at least not on our site we used to be used to have quite a busy uh you know little, little community there but we'll, we'll hopefully we'll regrow that at some point somewhere but anyway yeah so thanks again to john matthews for coming on the show um and uh, check out the you know, the description of the show for links to his book um, which he has kindly agreed to sign to people that you know, mm. people that pick it up. It is a, an excellent book, very comprehensive, very um, uh, you know, it's a the go-to book as far as I'm concerned now on oh. Spring Hill Jack. Um, and yeah, so we'll see you soon. It won't be straight away because we have a, a big international holiday between us and the next episode. <laughs> so um, it'll most likely be very early January. Will be the next show. Um, in fact, we're recording on the 3rd of January, so it'll be just after that. Um, so, yeah, have a nice uh, Christmas, and um, we hope to see you on the other side. Yes, and uh, a, f a good festive season to all our friends and allies in podcast land there. And, uh, and the real world. And, and, well, uh, we well, don't mind the real world. We do, uh, you know. Uh, we we, we, yeah. <laughs> anyway, on that note, uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>